humility. Like I'm so conscious of, I'm not being humble. I'm so conscious of like, just really lowering myself in a way that I never had before. And I'm also really conscious of like, how not doing it in the past, I was setting myself up for all kinds of negative things. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm, I mean, but, but yeah, it's just become really clear to me how different of a person I am. And it's a little, to be honest, it's a little disorienting. And it's also, it's not a little disorienting. It's a lot disorienting. And like, I really am having to lean hard, really hard on prayer because like, if I lean on myself, I find myself like second guessing myself because I'm realizing that like, I really didn't have the skills to deal with stuff that I thought. Yes. Let me, let me encourage you, my beloved. <laughs> okay. Remember that's good, but especially in this situation specifically, encounter engage interpret define humility not as thinking lower of yourself mm. but less often mm. because you need to have confidence right and so think of it as the humility that allow you to be in the flow you know you know how when you're in the flow you see you cease to exist it's just like mm. you're just engaged right and the second you become aware of what you're doing then you fall out of it Right. So, mm. so engage the pursuit of humility. And I was like, oh, you know, like, yes, that's great. You know, I need, you know, through Christ, I can do all things. But like in this case, it's thinking less often of yourself, not lower, but less often so that you can just come out of the picture and it's just like you're engaging and just try it because I, I would, I would think your flow count. Well, my should increase maybe, you know? No, that's, that's good actually, because yeah, one of the things that I was noticing and it started to give me a weird feeling is that like, I was noticing myself falling into a pattern that I had fallen into many times. I mean, the environment's very competitive, right? Like internally competitive because it's like competent people doing stuff with software. And, and it's always about like, you know, who's on the hierarchy or whatnot, because you got to call shots and, and whatever. But at the same time, you got to have people that you're managing who are like, you know, really better than you at a lot of things. And so it's like, I found myself falling into a pattern of doing things almost with the express reason of them, like making me look like making my profile and making me look good in a way, as opposed to just like, this is what like do the thing that gets the job done right mm -hmm. like going a little too far in terms of like polish and like oh if i do it in this way it'll make me look good as opposed to just like speaking from the heart to the people that matter and being like yo this is what needs to happen like here's mm -hmm. the deal you know so so yeah that that thinking less of myself is really that's thank you father that's like a really good helpful word right there mm -hmm. um because it, it articulates like what I was seeing and feeling and where I was like, Ooh, I'm doing something wrong, but I couldn't really figure out what it was that was wrong. I was just had this massive feeling like, Ooh, that's wrong, mm -hmm. you know, but that really articulates it. That's helpful. It's like, now you weren't thinking about moving things forward or the people around you, you were thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah. that, that's, that's a trap we all fall into, especially like humility is, I mean, it's such a thing, right? Like it's hard to really grasp because it it remains in this realm of abstract for such a long time. And mm. it's like an abstract concept, but like that that reality of just, you know, humility isn't like I'm a worm, I can't do anything, blah, blah, blah. Cause we read the fathers, we even read the hymnography of the church, and it's and it speaks in, in to some degree um deprecating tones. Mm. But, you know, like we have to, we have to take it in the right context. You know what I mean? Um, and we have to have a, an appreciation for 
the fact that there's a there's an absolutely ne necessary poetic aspect to hymnography because you can't you can't articulate spiritual movements without poetic you know language right but understanding po but understanding poetry because we understand poetry oftentimes it's like oh it's not literal so it's not true no absolutely actually poetry can be more true than a literal sentence right it can convey so much more but anyways like but in regards of humility thinking less often of yourself versus thinking you know lower or thinking poorly you know it's not about thinking poorly of yourself it's thinking like less often because even when someone's like i'm a worm i'm trash i'm this you're still thinking about yourself you're you're still at the center even though you're being like self-deprecating it's like yeah just get your eyes off of yourself either way whether it's just like mm. i'm the greatest or i'm the worst piece of trash like either way just get your eyes off yourself and get after what you need to get after Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. And right off the bat, Cyprian is a little bit laggy. We know it. I don't want to hear it. All right. He might, a little be, he might be a little bit laggy. We can't help it. So that being said, what is your guys's, like, best, like, uh, who's your, like, your favorite drummer slash what is the, like, coolest song for drums that you think of doesn't have to be complicated just you're just like when you think of a good song with some just awesome drums in it what do you guys think of i feel like you guys probably pick from almost any led zeppelin song even though i'm not big into led zeppelin but i mean man there's so many doesn't have to be complicated or technical it's just like just like because i mean like okay like magic man by heart like that is a great drum song. Uh, like just the dude, I don't know who plays the drums on that song. I haven't looked it up. But like the dude that is like rocking out in. Okay, like The Wizard by Sabbath. <laughs> like man, that's so good, right? That's so good. Uh, yeah. Is that your answer? I don't know. I don't know if I could. I... I don't know if I could pick a a a, a song in particular um, for for drums, but uh, but but my favorite drummer is Phil Collins. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> wow! So that's you know, great, man. Supreme, we love you. <laughs> that's Phil Collins. I'm just saying. Wow. Do you like his solo stuff, Cyprian? Yeah, I like everything. I like everything he's ever done. I love I love Genesis stuff. I love the solo Phil Collins stuff. Incredible. No, I love him. I mean, is he that great of a drummer? No, but he's my definitely my favorite drummer. If you I like his song with Philip like, Bailey, he's my favorite. No doubt. Yeah, um, I would say it's uh, not my favorite drummer, not my favorite band. But a song that is incredibly fun to play on drums. I can't remember what it's called. It's like track six or seven off of Two's lap uh, Two's <laughs> Tools Lateralist. Uh, just like pneumonia and the pneumonia or something like that. The one that's heavy. The one that like track seven or something like that. It's like um, I'll add it to the. Um, all these will go on the playlist. But it's just like a fun song to play on drums and when you watch Danny Carey like play it live it just looks so like it just looks so like it's just kind of all over the place it's not terribly like difficult and I'm, I'm kind of a drummer that's the reason why we pick drums and father and I talked a little bit about drums beforehand but um 
the it's just super fun to play and it's yeah it's not terribly complicated and it works really well with the way the song goes so um that's my answer so anyway well well guys I was like, the sugar oh man i know I that's mean, so i know it's so played out i don't care it's so good just so we know there's an entire genre i avoided I did not, I didn't even get into metal because like Meshuga is next level. I mean, Thomas Hake or Hike, I don't know how you say his mm-hmm. name. Um, he's out the dude is like 60 years old and he is still tearing it up. Their latest album is absolutely incredible. He has not lost a step. Nick Spencer from Archspire is absolutely insane. There's a video of him playing a song called Lucid Collective. Absolutely like. This dude has to rest muscles in his bodies when he's playing. He has to like switch his snares with his left. Like he goes like, like that with his hands because his arms get so tired. Like when he's blast beating. So he blast beats with his right, then his left and his right, then his left and his right. Cause it's like literally his back muscles are getting so tired from the way he's drumming. He has wow. to like actively rest parts of his body while he has to like plan that out because he's so absolutely insanely fast. Um, yeah, I'm done there. I'll stop. But like there is a like metal, you throw a dart at a death metal band from Sweden, uh, especially Sweden, um, maybe even some like Finnish death metal and stuff. Those drummers are off the wall. They are absolutely incredible. I, I avoided all of that because I didn't want to have this conversation I'm having right now. <laughs> so I'm going to move on. I'm just going to move on. So we had discussed about talking about it last week but we're going to get we're going to touch on it lightly we're going to try and not keep it we have to be controversial we have to be but we're going to talk about the filioque way for as long as as long as we talk about it um because it's important it's um yeah it's important it's important and i did a little bit of pre-pro for this so uh, I felt like this was the time to do it. So anyway, so last week we had talked about um, uh, the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father. Now, for those not in the know, and Father, please just stop me at any time and jump in, please, if I'm starting to kind of lead astray a little bit. But the filioque is this idea uh, that or was this this wording that was added into the creed at a certain point was taken out then added back in um, and it basically was one of the main reasons why the west and the east split from each other where there was the schism in 1054 of course this is big broad strokes there's a lot more that went into this but we don't have time for that so we're just going to go through the broad strokes um, and then the schism between the east and the west in 1054 and basically what it comes down to is this wording that um, the Orthodox say in our creed, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. Now, the filioque, which is traditionally what the Western church says, or the Catholics, you know, people who know things in the West, uh, who recite the creed in the West, they'll say, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, why this is not good from a layman from the limited amount of knowledge I know is because what that does is it gives like an order to the Trinity in which one is subservient to the other two. So far, so good, Father? Yep. Okay. So um, that is, um, that was a big sticking point. And basically what that means is constantly within Orthodox hymnography, within <clears throat> like our verbiage, within, within like the way we say things, co-substantial and undivided. They are equal and one in essence. Any kind of hinting, any kind of like that one is lesser than the other has got to go right away. Like got to go. If you are corrected on that and you refuse to, you know, acknowledge that or to like step away from that thought, then it's a heresy, you know, anathema. So um, I've never been to a Catholic mass, but my wife was Catholic and she says that they still say it like that, that that proceeds from the father and the son. So, Father, I wanted to kind of touch, that's, that's the very, very basics of it, but Father, I kind of wanted to touch on, like, why that is so 
I guess, could you expound a little bit on why that is just so important as the way that it is? Obviously, maintaining that the Trinity are one in essence, indivisible and completely equal. You know? <sighs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to get out of my depth in regards of getting into um, the what and the how per se, because there's a lot of really good <clears throat> um, academic theologians who would do a much better job and, and I would just kind of like butcher it. I'm just, I'm a simple priest at best. I think where I feel really comfortable speaking on this is the why, why it's so problematic. And maybe even a little bit of how it's problematic in regards of the way that it affects. I actually feel really good speaking about that, about the how too, um, because one of the things that's really problematic when we have these discussions, I know, I know some very good pious Roman Catholics. And I think this is a great opportunity to kind of speak to that a little bit because, absolutely, um, you know, it's, it's just really hard because when, as, you know, um, as Orthodox, you know, and, and what I mean by that is like, you know, not trying to rest in some weird unchristlike polemical disposition just for the sake of being cantankerous or disagreeable sure. and unfortunately you can kind of get that vibe from a lot of orthodox folk but that's not where i'm coming from so there's there's you know i, I think especially now and don't worry i'll get into it i just i have to kind of throw throw some bones out to some people that's good especially especially now with how bad the state of the world is not just the west but how bad the state of the world is in regards of not simply morality, but also to the, the nature of reality, right? Like I said, not just simply morality, but the nature of reality is becoming unraveled. Um, and alphabet soup month, you know, um, transhumanism, all of these things are such huge issues that in many ways, when the Lord says, you know, there'll be one flock, one shepherd, I see where there is an absolute need for, you know, especially like Orthodox and, and, and Catholics to really find common ground. Um, but it has to be common ground based on truth and not based on um, sentimental unity because that doesn't serve anybody, right? And, that, and that's what I find to be the real problem is that when people talk about unity, it's not based on truth, it's based upon sentimentality, right? So all that being said, you know, there's some really, you know, good, well-meaning, you know, Roman Catholics. And I, and I mean, to be frank, it's one of those things where it's easy for us from the inside because, you know, we've seen the light. <laughs> but, you know, if you're looking on the outside in, on, 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 their, on their end, I mean, it would make sense, right? Because, you could look at us and just think, oh, the Orthodox are a mess, especially if you're in the States, right? It's like they're a mess, like they're less than however percentage of the population. It just, it looks, you know, it, and this is, now we're going to start getting into it. It looks from a worldly perspective that like they're right and that we're just, you know, kind of bitter, insular, you know, tribes. And, you know, that there's some validity to that critique. Now, all that being said, let's start talking a little bit about the why and the how that's problematic. But before we get into that, let me just touch on the little bit of the what that I feel comfortable talking about. So like you said, there's this subordinism, which brings the Holy Spirit, it subordinates the Holy Spirit in the person of the Trinity. And it's, and it's problematic, obviously. Um, and it does a lot of things. It supports the Holy Spirit. It subordinates the Holy Spirit. It also begins to distort the primacy of the Father and what that looks like. It gives too much, it gives an unbalanced emphasis to the primacy of the Father as well, you know? 
excuse me, it begins to really mess with and, and it, it leads to at least all kinds of problems, you know, in, in, a, in a technical aspect um, in regards of, you know, the personhood of the Trinity, that, that intercommunion, which is fundamental to reality and understanding like what we are now that's about as far as I want to go on the technical side of it. Cause we, in order to really get into this, we have to keep that portion simple, right? So to keep it simple, the father is the source, right? The son is begotten and the spirit proceeds from the father, right? So, in, so this is, this is, this, this is simple. We'll keep it, we'll keep it simple, at the technical level, because as we get into the how and the why, that's much more messy. And in order to navigate that and not get lost in that, we have to keep that that kind of anchor solid, if you guys are following me. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So the first thing I want to talk about in this regard then is um, there's a fundamentally one of the problems is that it leads into, thank you, it leads into a Man, people are bringing me gifts tonight. God bless <laughs> all, my, all my children. God bless them. You were just like bringing me gifts. God bless all of you. So uh, it, it, it brings us into this first real issue. And that is, it begins to highlight the um, speculative nature of Roman Catholic theology, right? As opposed to our absolute emphasis on uh, the empirical nature of, of empirical or experiential nature of theology, true theology, and the fact that revelation is the key. Why do we even know about the Trinity? It's revelation. It was, it's not deduced through some sort of like philosophical sophistry. So you begin to see right off the bat, there's a speculative aspect that begins to now color so much of, at least from our perspective, how we see the West has approached God and theology and all those things begin to affect the, the anthropological, sociological facets of, of, of existence, right? This is, this is why, you know, I'm gonna start pulling out all the old tropes that we've maybe talked about before, or if you've been Orthodox for a while, you've heard these before, but like, okay, for those who haven't heard, like one of the differences we would say between the East and the West, and these are all real simple, right? These are all what I would call um, elevator pitches, right? Just like 1054 is an elevator pitch, right? Yeah. It's like, it, it's way more complicated than that. And and obviously, you know, the schism between the East and the West has has, just as much, if not more, to do with cultural, economic issues than it does like technical, clinical, quote unquote, like theological matters, right? But the problem is, again, we don't, we, orthodoxy strives to remove dichotomies, whereas the Western mindset, my, Western mindset inserts dichotomies, if you understand what I'm saying. So no, this whole concept of classification, okay, classification, right? It's like classification, like we, we exist, like our dispositions, like, like taxonomy, you know, it's like, it's like classification, like, boom, like we want to get it down to, you know, okay, if you want to understand Andrew, you have, okay, race, gender, class, like, you know what I mean? All of these dichotomies, classification, right? Like a zoo, zoology, you know, like, okay. Oh, okay. So, you see what I'm saying? Yes. So, this, so this tendency towards classification is part of the problem. One of the biggest problems with Western spirituality. And you talk to any Roman Catholic who's converted and has converted for a period of time, they'll tell you, this is one of the, this is one of the harder things for them to kind of like buck a little bit because there's a fluidity in regards of orthodox spirituality, a, an Eastern quote unquote mindset that's very hard to get into unless you begin really kind of like understanding this tendency towards this kind of like classification or inserting dichotomies, right? If, okay. if, if you guys are following me at all, right? Yes, yeah. Um, 
one of the reasons why I would submit to you things like alchemy, things like, like demonology and, and magic, as we would understand it, you don't have it in the East like you do in the West. In the West, it's based so much on these very, um, the very spirit of sorcery. I know I talk so much about sorcery, but the very spirit of magic, of sorcery, of, is, is this kind of like mastery through dissection mastery through dissection so in other words i do this at this time on this date in this order boom right i have i have success if if something's off it's because i wasn't exactly correct you know what i mean um in my outcome like system, systematization systematization like systematizing yep yeah. systematization classification right you like you see it you see it in the way that we approach rubrics, in the way that we approach prayer, all of these things, right? And and even in like, even the Russian tradition, which is much more r rigorous, and in, in, I, I say that in the positive sense, which by the way, I'm, you know, we're in the Serbian tradition and, um, you know, I, I I come, I'm more familiar and, and live in the in the Slavic tradition. So just so no one throws hate mail at me, right? Like, but for this sake, if you're following what I'm saying, I love the Russian tradition. I'm what I'm saying is though is out of in comparison to the 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 more Hellenistic styles, right? It is the more rigid, right? And and there's a whole historical thing with that. And I wouldn't call it rigid, but in comparison, right? The point I'm trying to get at is. The West is, in regards to Rubik's, very much, it's this kind of like magical sense of like timing, boom, boom, right? And it comes from this disposition of classification, you know what I mean? Um, again, dichotomies, this is a key thing we're going to keep coming back to, dichotomies, right? A separation, inserting a dichotomy, or we would say false dichotomy, for the sake of being able to appropriate an understanding which equates into mastery if, if that if you're under, if you're following what i'm saying right so mm -hmm. getting into this thing with with the trinity and the subordination that that comes with the filioque and seeing how the spirit of it or, or really like i don't think it's a matter of the filioque brought this in but really the, but rather the filioque is kind of like a uh, a fruit of it Right. And so, you know, revelation versus versus speculation, you know, um, also to a tendency to need, you know. In the West, you know, the Roman Catholics have, from my perspective, with you know, not being Roman Catholic, but it, it definitely seems that there is a, a, an aspect of mystery that is maintained. But, you know de facto the way it plays out especially in comparison to to our tradition in our our lived experiences as orthodox christians you know it, it's i mean it, it it it's almost all but gone and and this is part of what i think people often mistake when they look at us kind of like oh you guys are backwards oh this and that but what it is is they actually aren't used to encountering mystery in this in this context right because the mystery isn't just kind of like you know, blinding yourself and just fumbling around, it actually has much, has so much to do with how you actually encounter revelation, mm. right? It, because, because remember, revelation is not something that you've discovered. Revelation is something that's revealed to you. And this, this is, again, very important to understand. So for us, Revelation is revealed to us. It's not something we've discovered, and therefore we must honor it because that's how God has revealed it to us. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So this is why we're so particular on dogma and, and certain things because it's like, no, this isn't us just kind of liking whatever. This is what God revealed to us. And so this is why we're looked at by outsiders as like, oh, you guys are just, you know, religious theological curmudgeons who just don't want to change anything and it's like no 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 i mean there may be some aspect to that there may be some truth in that 
critique on a, on a small local level, but when you get into the essence, the heart of the church, no, 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 it's because it has to do with these things have been revealed to us. And remember, like we talked about earlier, <clears throat> tradition is the revelation and the experience of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. So these aren't just willy-nilly things, which is why the, which is why, <laughs> you know what I almost said, which is why 2020 and what happened there was such a big deal. And still, I maintain this, you know, bring it on hate mail. Uh, those who still don't get it, you really don't get it, right? This 2020 and everything that happened and changed the church, at first, that, that initial getting through it may have been having a lot of political overtone and everything like that. But at this point right now, okay, I won't speak for anyone else, uh, for me and the people I run with, the, the politics is like whatever. It, it really is down to the spirit of what's of what it means and, and why you can't just, you know, if, if you think you can just futz around with the things of the church has been revealed to us, it's like that and that at its core says something about how you encounter and experience the things of the church and the things of God. Yes. Right. Yeah. I know I'm just, I know I'm like a fire hose right now, but I'm just, I want to kind of like keep going because there's a lot here, right? So, so this thing about revelation is, is really key because. Oh, I'm sorry, Father, one second. Yes. If I can say G.K. Chesterton in his book, Orthodoxy, um, it says that uh, the difference between sanity and insanity is the idea of having your head in the heavens is sanity and having the heaven, trying to have the heavens in your head is insanity. So like when you were talking about, it's yeah, it's not a bad book. Um, when you're talking about like the fl classification, it sounds like, like, forgive me, it sounds like D&D. &D. It sounds like this is a level three ice mm -hmm. spell. It is powerful against right. this, you know, this thing. Right. right. Instead of like the true D&D &D would be like, well, it's a mystery. A lot of different things could happen if you do this, you know, right. like it's up to right. God. So, right. So. So this whole experience of revelation and moving out of the kind of mastery of self, right? Like I'll just say out of experience, it's all, it's very satisfying for me with God's help when I'm able to help people kind of out of this, but it's tough because a lot of folk, they'll, they'll okay, like here, here's a very common thing that happens. People will be in the church for a period of time, you know, two, four, six years, eight years, whatever. And they're doing great, but then oftentimes they're not exposed to the noetic tradition. They're not exposed to the Neptic Fathers. They're not exposed to some of the deep kind of like deep tradition. I hate to say it that way because it, it, some people feel that that's kind of agnostic, whatever, but like you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is a very superficial, not superficial as in it's bad, but it's the surface layer of the tradition that people encounter. And you can kind of stay there forever, right? You can stay there forever. Um, but for those of us who need more because of how terrible we are, that doesn't, but you can't stay there. So what happens is, is like you, you almost by necessity begin to need to like start plunging like greater depths and not in some kind of weird like oh i'm deep like some sort of um pretentious thing it's actually a very difficult tough thing to do because it has more to do with your pride than it does how much you've you know how much you've learned if you're following me right so what we're talking about is not like oh i've cracked open the philokalia now i'm like deep that's what i'm talking about what i'm talking about is like god has shown you yourself god has shown you how wrong you are about him how wrong you are about other people how wrong you are about yourself and you're going to make that choice whether you're going to you're going to accept that or reject it that's what i'm talking about right and so these constructs that we have being born here um, they're very difficult to let go. I mean, very, very difficult to let go. I can't emphasize it enough. So when you begin to understand that this, 
this way, this approach towards theology and God is the way that we approach interpersonal relationships too. I know who you are because you're from Missouri, you have a beard, you have messy hair, you're this, you're, you know what I mean? Like that, that tendency comes from all this, right? It, it comes from all this, right? And so you begin to see how these theological movements matter. Now, why they matter, we start moving into, it's very difficult now to have a, a proper relationship to God. Well, how do you know it's proper? Well, the fathers tell us and they show us that the need to have, you know, and this is going to make some people's heads kind of spin, but there is a need to have a quote unquote personal relationship with God. Now, it isn't in the sense as evangelicals phrase it, because evangelicals, when they phrase a personal relationship with God, they're coming historically out of a context of rejecting, but so the Reformation is rejecting the institutional rigors and, and framework of Roman Catholicism, right? So it's like, oh, no, no, that's all just kind of like an empty framework. Uh, and you need to have actually encounter God. Okay, so there, there's truth to that, and that's good. But the problem with it is, is there, you know, we would say, for instance, Rome adds too much, and evangelical Protestantism Reformation takes too much out, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. that so that being said, for most evangelicals, what they'll find when they come into the church is that there's a sentimentality. And, you know, for us, we would say there's a very delusional aspect to their approach to God, right? So they have this whole, like, you know, kind of Jesus yeah. is my boyfriend, Jesus is my homeboy type of disposition. And, like, that's not, that's not accurate um, because it really supplants some very key things that are necessary to approach God, namely humility, yeah. Right. And, and and the fact that, you know, although, you know, the Lord desires to call us friend and no longer slaves, it says in the scriptures, you have to understand what that context is. Right. And so to kind of make very simple <clears throat> what I'm saying here and to just move on, God accepts you as you are, but he loves you. You know, he loves you enough to not leave you there. Right. That that's that's how we would say. And that's how we have experienced God, those of us who have been in the church and have really gone through this process and are still going through it, right? Still going through it, but God loves us enough not to leave us there. Now, moving on from that, you start to begin to really understand now where people find themselves stuck in this very sentimental disposition, right? And that sentimentality in many ways, whether they recognize it or not, is a social, cultural rejection of this kind of classification, systematic, systematic approach to God, if you're, if you're what I'm saying. So this kind of like shadow, living in the shadow of a very cold, uh, uh, you know, almost commerce-based relationship with God, as most, you know, Roman Catholics, quote unquote, have talked about experiencing, like there's, there's validity to that. There's truth to that, because I will tell you, from experience, right, having spiritual children that are that have come out of Catholicism and are becoming, you know, are, are in the church, uh, and I'm not talking, you know, just like a couple of years in. I'm talking like longtime Orthodox, still working out, you know, errors from being raised Roman Catholic, um, even pre-Vatican II, right? You know, I have a I have a spiritual daughter who's pre-Vatican II. Um, and so much of her struggle is working some of these things out. And you begin to see that, forget internet orthodoxy, like I'm telling you from experience, like those issues are real. They aren't just simply kind of like these check marks of like, you know, Roman Catholics do this and Orthodox do that. It's, it is a very different approach. It, it's, I would say, experience, not even approach experience. I would say it's kind of like the difference between, um, it's like, uh, oh, okay, okay. I don't know if this, yeah, maybe this might work. Um, 
it's kind of like the difference between um, riding a bike and like swimming, right? If you, if you think, if, if, you, if you think about the mechanics of riding a bike and even in the fact that you're using, like it involves this foreign object, this mechanized object, which allows you to move. And, and I mean, you know, I'm a, I don't, I'm, I almost said I'm a cyclist. I'm not a cyclist. I like, I enjoy riding bikes, right? I, I enjoy, you know, riding a bike. Um, You've been it's, known it's to ride a bike or two. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, I love riding my bike. Okay, great. Um, winds in your hair, there's fluid movement, all that stuff, right? But it's categorically different than swimming on every level, right? The way your body's engaged, the fact that you are, I forgive me, everyone, it's a, it's, a, it's, oh, this sounds terrible, but it is almost a perfect analogy because with swimming, it's you engaged with some, with, with, it's you engaged directly with an element outside yourself. Like, and let's, you, you, you see what I'm saying? It's mm. you engaged directly with an element outside yourself and you, in order to swim, have to become immersed in it. You become immersed in that, in the water. And it, and it takes every fiber of your being to swim. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Every, like, hold everything. Think about it. Holding the breath of your back muscles. You use all these. You, there's every aspect of your being that's involved with swimming if you're going to swim. So it's orthodox swimming or bike riding? Oh, yeah. Orthodoxy is swimming. Yeah, I was going to. Okay. Roman Catholicism is bike riding. You know what I mean? I, I hear you. Yeah. And. And this is this is why like you can get you can get super technical with swimming, you know what I mean? But that that technicality, you know, it's like technicality in this context of swimming leads you into like the area of being a specialist, right? Like I'm a swimmer, I'm an Olympic swimmer, I do this and that. I have these techniques that I employ for a specific purpose. And this is where we start getting into like. Well, this is the place of because there is a place for academic theologians in Orthodox. I think we talked about this before, right? But it's not what people think it is, right? Um, monasticism, um, you know, seminary, whether someone's, you know, you know, and, and the clergy, seminary trained or not, you know, the lady, like there's all these different kind of, I don't want to say specializations, but I'll say it for lack of a better term that you begin to experience with swimming, but everyone's swimming everyone's swimming and, and, you, and you have to be immersed all that stuff whereas with the bike riding there's there's this whole other there's a sep i mean you are engaged with um with something that isn't living in that sense you're engaged with the bike you know what i mean and the bike allows you to engage the elements in regards of you know the material earth you know and the wind and all that stuff but that mechanized that mechanized uh, mm, there, there is a dichotomy <laughs> that's inserted there in order for you to experience movement on that level and all of the kind of like attributes of that movement, including wind in your hair, the feeling of like fluid movement, right? All of those things, right, are attributes of you engaging movement but you have to use this mechanized thing which in itself is to some degree paradoxically opposed to that because a mechan mechanized something that's mechanized is is in is by definition rigid in comparison to you know a, a natural manifestation of a, a manifestation of nature there's a fluidity to nature that we encounter that even when you start talking, it's like, what is he talking about? Like, even, even if you're talking about like the earth, there is, a, there is an aspect in which there has to be a measure of surrender. If you're, if you're following me, right? The, the key thing is it there's a sense of mastery that has to be removed 
when you when you enter into this this world of of the, well, the bike is, the bike is a tool of conquest mm -hmm. like the bike the bike is a, a a means by which you can conquer the elements but if you're swimming it's the opposite you have to you have to surrender mm -hmm. first and foremost to the element that you're in before you can even start to move in it mm -hmm. like you have to just recognize like i can't beat it mm -hmm. so i have to engage it like for on its own let you have to engage the water as the water you can't right. engage it as anything else but when you're bike riding you're just engaging the bike right bingo bingo so oh. so oh, i'm sorry father i'm just gonna, just gonna i'm gonna go ahead and at certain points in that last uh the last uh what you're talking about my head started to spin so i'm gonna back up just to make sure i'm with you yeah, just forgive me forgive no me. you're good this is my job it's like I'm like the red shirt in Star Trek that says like letting the air out of a balloon after the whole big sciencey thing happens. They say, we'll reverse the nanotrons and then like letting the air out of a balloon. Like that's me. I'm that guy. So we're going to back up just a second. We're going to say you have this. You have these two things. You have riding a bike. You have swimming. OK, the mechanics can resemble each other in certain senses. Um, but and certain key aspects they are completely different so the bike is you're engaging with a mechanical device built by man right so there has to be this like you push and the bike kind of flow, follows your movement and stuff like that and you have to kind of work at the bike to get going okay and we're talking about in this in the most complementary way possible this is kind of an analogy for catholicism while as orthodoxy you are swimming now, some of these mechanics, you may be using the same muscles, you may be using some of the same techniques, but they couldn't really, they, they're very, very different. One is you're using all your muscles, you're having to surrender, you're having to work with the thing that is surrounding you, rather than focusing on this one little thing, which is hands on handlebars, keep pushing, don't hit the, like the spiky death sticks from Missouri, the spiky death balls, so that you fall over, and then also when you're swimming make sure that you're not taking on more than you can you see what i'm saying like these things they yeah they, yeah, yeah yeah they made i mean sorry i'm done yeah yeah forgive me i just it's it's a it's a it's a perfect analogy because it, it's i'm sure we can follow it down and it'll break down at some point but it keeps going right because even because you basically reiterated some of what cyprian said but then you kept going and there's, a, I'm like, yeah, there's aspects that we, if we just kept going with that, it, it plays out more and more. Right. And so, so I, I want to run with that a little bit more because this, so one of the things that um, I have found consistently with my spiritual children that have come out of Roman Catholicism that are now Orthodox um, and, you know, just for the record, like two of them have been monastics, you know, uh, and the rest of them, you know, lay people of various stripes, whatever. Some people coming out of very, very traditional, almost hyper traditional, uh, you know, sex or whatever within Catholicism. Some people just coming out of like Novus Order, like new, like just kind of contemporary Vatican II, like, right. So the thing that I, I found consistent with them is that there is a struggle to transition into this aspect. There's two things they struggle with. They struggle with the way that the tradition, orthodoxy presents to you things like asceticism, things like obviously liturgical prayer, liturgical life, but that's not the thing in of itself, right? So it, it's a very difficult thing because it's not just a matter of getting it down mastering it and honing it like exactly like if you're being rigid in orthodoxy you you, you begin to, to lose it right it's like he who seeks to you know find his life you know must lose it for my sake so the more you try to grab onto it the, the more it slips out of your hands so that's the first thing but the second thing and most importantly is consistently what i found is they have it they have struggled with this sense of god doesn't like me god is like you know i God needs to be appeased, you know, God, um, God is very distant, you know what I mean? 
And this is something I found consistent. And again, I, like we're not talking about a monolith of people. We're talking about, you know, people from different, um, you know, sociological backgrounds, genders, even age groups, you know what I mean? And that I found that to be a consistent thing. So what that speaks to, again, is some of, you know, getting back into this, uh, this, this tendency towards like mastery systematization, right? Conflating the organization with organism. And, and that's one of the things, you know, like uh, I was privy to being at this colloquium in like 2003. What's up, 2000. colloquium? Uh, it was, it's basically a, um, a colloquium, let me make it real simple. It's, it's like a, uh, a, a speaking engagement lecture with multiple speakers or a few speakers that are engaging on a, on a shared topic. Oh, it's, I'm, this is not like an Orthodox thing. This is just a speaker thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, so it was at Loyal Marymount, the big Roman Catholic uh, University in California. And uh, Father Justin, who at the time, I don't know now, but at the time, he was the only English speaking uh, monastic in uh, St. Catharines in Sinai. Uh, the, he was the guardian um, of so, so big kind of like rabbit trail, but whatever. Um, St. Catherine's the monster in Sinai has, has pretty much, I mean, not the only, but like some of the oldest icons, right? They have them in, the, in this monastery, mostly because all the ones prior to this were destroyed by the iconoclasts. Anyways, I'm sure there's ones on Athos, blah, blah, blah. But point being is St. Catherine's are known for having like some of the oldest icons, like, you know, the Sinai Christ that we talked about many episodes ago, right? The Pantocrator. That's that's at that monastery. Anyways, so they have this exhibit at the Getty, and he was the caretaker. He's the guardian. And so while he was there, they were going to do this colloquium on iconography, whatever. And they wanted to kind of like, I don't know, I, I guess I get it, like ecumenical stuff, but it's like they had Father Justin representing the Orthodox. They had some Monsignor representing the Catholics, obviously, and some like Protestant dude, you know, like Pastor <laughs> Jim. Yeah, like representing like the evangelicals, some like theologian, quote unquote, whatever. <laughs> so uh, what was really interesting was the Monsignor. He kicked it off right, and he made this interesting joke. He's like. He's talking about like, you know, I'm here representing the Catholics, Father Justin, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, you know, I guess in one way as you can look at it too, because we ba basically joke was since we've organized the colloquium, it's kind of a representation of the fact that the, Ro the Roman church is known for our administration. You know what I mean? And then he made like a dig at the Orthodox for being unorganized, whatever. But like, that was kind of interesting because I mean, there, there's, there's truth to that. I mean, this, this gets into the whole thing with like Dostoevsky and the Grand Inquisitor, if anyone's ever read it. If you haven't read it, you know, it's in the Brothers Karamazov. It's, it's, you can read this one section of the Brothers K separate from everything else. It's called the Grand Inquisitor. I encourage everyone to read it because it will help you really get an insight into some of what I'm speaking about in regards of like, not just how we view the distinctions between the East and the West, but but like what that looks like and kind of like almost the why. The Grand Inquisitor is essentially this this portion of, in the Brothers Karamazov where one of the brothers is, is basically kind of like breaking down his perspective on things. Anyways, Christ comes back and there's this, this cardinal during the Inquisition who, who recognizes Christ even though no one else recognizes him, he arrests him and he begins to interrogate him. And he basically begins to lambast the Lord. He's like stuff like, oh, you know, you left all these years ago and it was left to us to keep things in order, you know, all, all the stuff going on. And he's, he goes through the temptations of Christ. And basically what Dostoevsky is saying is, 
you know, um, this third temptation of, of the Lord being raised up on high and, and being shown all the, uh, um, all the nations to rule and, you know, the Lord rejecting that he's like Rome basically like fell at that temptation. And this is how you begin to see not just why they are kind of the, like the largest church in regards of administration, but like, but like the why, you know? So anyways, this is really key because this is a, this is something that plays out to people on the ground. This plays out to everyday people, like the people that have been my spiritual children, they're everyday people. Um, and their experiences, again, like I said, span pre-Vatican II to all the way up until, you know, whatever. And they have a shared reality. And that reality comes from this. Anyways, yes. So, Father, how, how does one reconcile something like uh, God is, um, because I've never been Catholic, but I do struggle with this idea that God is mad at me that he's upset with me or, you know, or whatever that like, I've, I've, um, he's someone I need to appease, you know, like, how do I reconcile that with these saints who spend, you know, 20, 30, 35 years in asceticism, uh, kind of just, you know, going hard, hard, hard. And then suddenly like an angel comes in and says, God has forgiven your sins. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, I mean, easy, 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 because okay. they're not, they're not doing that because, because they feel like God's mad at them. They feel it because they've realized their sin. Right. So, so the, like, let's look at it this way, right? In some regards, <laughs> you, it, if you spend enough time around quote unquote cradle orthodox, like you can almost get scandalized because it's like almost the flip side. It's almost like, <laughs> it's like they, they can almost seem to be disrespectful towards God. Like, like they're the ones like pulling God's ear and being like, you need to do this for me. It's it's a very flip. It's it, it's an inverse of this kind of like stereotype of Catholic guilt and all these things, right? Because because the Eastern experience of God, it, it like this thing, this what you said proves my point. You weren't even raised Catholic, but you're still a Westerner. Okay. And so in the West, you know, look, man, you know, forgive me for pointing out Joe Biden, like, <laughs> like the, the Reformation is a child of Rome and, and, and evangelicals and, and Protestants, they, they think they're so far removed from Rome, but they're, but they're, they have way more in common with them than they realize. Like, I'm going to tell you something. It, in some regards, in some regards, evangelicals have more in common with Roman Catholics than Roman Catholics think they have in common with Orthodox. And in a lot of ways. Boom. In no, I agree. Ways, I agree. You know, so so this this whole thing of this the mechanization, the classification, the rigidity, um, you know, this kind of zoological approach to god and to reality the fruit of it are these things that we're talking about right the, the, this is the fruit of it and the filioque is like an icon an inverted icon if you will of all of this so it starts there and that's why theology matters because theology affects how a society interacts with god which is and who is reality right so we can now like move onto another aspect of it, which is you begin to see also how it impacts, you know, the, the way that the church, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm Cyprian. I had a question for you. Was, yeah. do you struggle with the guilt? I don't, you know, you don't have to give too much away. Do you struggle with the guilt? Like, cause I, I know that you did spend some time in the evangelical camp. Is this something that I'm alone in struggling with, or is this something that like, is fairly common. You're another guy from a Protestant background, so I thought I'd ask. Well, and I was baptized Roman Catholic. I mean, I am half oh, Mexican. Well, then there. So it's like I was raised in I was raised in a Catholic milieu on one side for sure. Okay. Um, honestly, no. And I think it's one of the things that like drove me probably to the occult. 
for my spirituality more than anything was because I just didn't, I, 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 I don't, I don't have the guilt. Like I just, I just want to get closer to the, the thing, like the experience. That's what I'm always after. And so I just know that like, if I'm sitting in sin, that I'm going to have a difficult time getting, like, I just know that when I'm not, when I'm not like just in the soup, the, the soup of sin, like if, when I'm not living in a sin soup, it's just a very different experience than when I am in a sin soup. Cause I've tried both. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's just a very different experience. And so I'm like, okay, but honestly, Andrew, it's weird that you asked that because I have often thought like, should I feel more guilty? Like I've, it's yeah. weird. I've almost felt guilty that I don't feel guilty. So there's something, <laughs> there's something <laughs> meta there. Catholic. It's really so weird. So Catholic. <laughs> it's really weird <laughs> that's i forget there's some simpsons joke or something like that it's like ah oh, the guilt of not feeling guilt or something like that like yeah, they're like digging that. at christianity like or something I yeah can't it's really weird father can i ask them really quick and not to divert us too far from what keep it keep your thought close in your head but i have a, a question if father if we're if we're struggling with guilt is there a broad strokes approach to the way we could kind of be seeing that because you know i then there's a part I think of a lot from a show called 30 Rock, where uh, Jack Donaghy, played by Alec Baldwin, is trying to talk someone out of becoming Irish Catholic. And he's talking about the guilt you feel all the time. You can be sitting in a park eating tacos and you're just feeling guilty. And like, I don't relate with that anymore. But there were times definitely since becoming Orthodox that I have felt just nonstop guilt. Is that like a good thing? Is that something I should explore? broad strokes is there like something that that is speaking to like is it pride is it ego is it like leftovers from my emotional or my western upbringing yeah yes mm -hmm. uh all oh, of it yes, like, like, yeah. yeah yes and i mean i mean I, I think the thing is about guilt especially is that like it, it has its place um but I, I think the thing is, is that it, it, when we're talking about guilt in this context, it's, it's a, it's almost like a neurotic psychological thing. That's how I would, that's how I would describe you know what I mean? it. I mean, and so that's why, again, like, um, you know, I would, I would say that, especially to that kind of guilt, if it's experienced, it's like, there's something wrong with the relationship. You know, it's like there, there's a transactional aspect to that that is not okay, you know? Um, and it's definitely not repentance. Now, there's a, there is a place for guilt, but really, you know, just like I would, I would say, and this, I remember this was a shocker for people, but it's like, uh, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, I gave this homie a couple of years ago about shame, you know what I mean? And good shame and like, I rocked a lot of people, but it, it's it's one of those things where if you really want to get down um, to the brass tacks of things, you're going to have to learn to embrace shame. And shame, as opposed to guilt, not the toxic shame. And, and toxic shame looks more like guilt than it does actual, you know, like godly shame. Because shame is there shame is the fruit of, of a, of a, um, of a wounded conscience, mm -hmm. right? Shame, shame is, shame comes from, you know, you have, you, you've, you've transgressed, right? And so, you know, like when someone's healthy enough, I, I want to help them as their confessor embrace shame because it's where you figure out where you're hurt. It, it, it's where you begin to figure out where you're sick, right? Mm. But our our society is so sick that, you know, you have your therapist, this is ugh, like, you have all these therapists telling people to get rid of shame, get rid of shame, no shame, no shame. And they don't make the distinction because there is no distinction, really speaking, I'm, I'm sure they exist, but generally speaking for most therapists most secular therapists they don't make that distinction and so for them 
because that's the milieu that they've been swimming in, you know, in the mental health industry for however many, you know, you know, years and decades at this point. Shame is bad. And just basically you want to free yourself of any shame and guilt and everything goes kind of. And the someone says, that's a gross mischaracterization, blah, blah, blah. It's I don't not, think so. I don't not. think so. I got pull at the majority, like for, that's not a mischaracterization. So I you agree. Can write me if you want to. I, I have no problem going to the mat with you on that. Andrew at royalpath.net. Yeah. Go I'll, ahead and like yeah. come at me, bro. For real. <laughs> I will I will stand by that. So um so like this thing with the shame though, it's like again, real quick. I've given this analogy before, but you know, there's an there's an accident. Boom. Accident. You know, Cyprian's laying, you know, Cyprian's sitting on the side of the road, his car's totaled. I'm the NT, I come up, I'm like, I don't see any blood coming out of any of his orifices. It's like, whatever he's, you know, but like he was in this, he was in this accident. So what do I do? Like, well, I'm, I'm touching, like, do you hurt here, here, right? I, where I, where I touch him, like, oh, ah, like that pain is where he's hurt, even though I can't see it. You see what I'm saying? There's no like protruding bone. That's, it's the same sense, the shame. So learning, to learning to distinguish the two, right? Between quote unquote toxic shame or guilt and finding that place of godly healthy shame. You wanna see yourself grow spiritually, start talking to your confessor about how to build up a, a tolerance for shame. And I mean, all these, all these people like, I wanna to talk to God, where's God, blah, blah, blah. Well, start to start figuring out how to like, embrace a little bit of the shame embrace this place in which you know repentance is needed you'll start seeing god real quick like and i'm gonna tell you something you're gonna see god so much you're gonna want to kind of like close the curtain a little bit you're gonna be like well real i'll talk to you a little bit later god yeah. i'm just telling you that's that that's what that's like you know and and so the the function of sacraments and and ritual from my perspective now again I've never been Roman Catholic, but I have spiritual children, again, who are pre-Vatican II all the way to now. It's, it's also a very different approach. In some regards, the sacraments and the experience can, can sometimes, unfortunately, be almost like, um, it, it can almost be like a curtain as opposed to a veil. Right. Mm. So I would say for us, the sacraments and the surgical life, they're veils that allow us to 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 come closer to the holiness of God. Whereas from my experience, the sacramental life for maybe maybe I just get like the really bad disaffected ones. I don't know. But for them, and I, I don't think so. I'm just being facetious. Like sure. it, it really functions almost like a curtain because. It's almost like if I'm engaging in the sacraments a certain way and blah, 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 that's where that kind of mechanized, systematized, almost magical approach to it, it really obfuscates God. And that's why they can feel so far from God. And, and it's, it's this weird tension that isn't healthy because for many of them, the sacramental experience to some degree has kind of been this weird uh, thing that's distanced them from God in certain aspects. Right. Whereas for us, it, it draws you closer if you want to, you know, early enter into it, you know. So the, it's, it's bringing up the so this practice of Eucharistic adoration, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that the a lot of these trads have told me that they're really, really into. And it's like where they Cyprian, what's a trad a tr tradition, like a traditional Catholic. So it's like a, it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a movement, like it's, it's got sure. some political aspects and some other things. Right. But so I, I know some I know some folks and they're you know I mean they're 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 good folks um, but yeah this and I don't I'm not I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna like create a scandal here because I don't understand it well enough but what I do understand about it is that the is that they they kind of like set the wafer up in a chapel and then they like do a, like a meditation or something like a special kind of meditation like in a chapel focused on the wafer itself like the blessed wafer and i just 
found it to be so so different from the orthodox experience of like even when when you guys were coming here and it was like well you better learn how to make prospera like you better learn how to make the bread mm-hmm. you know um that it's like this communal thing that is that like the people mm-hmm. are doing it as opposed to mm-hmm. like it's made by the institution like you have to get the wafers that come from oh. the institution mm-hmm. and then That's we're actually scary. gonna like worship the wafer that comes from the institution you know what i mean yeah as opposed like... to like no this was baked by the people so that's, I, very, I, that's a very interesting way of putting that i like that cipri and that's very interesting yeah like yes and and just to be charitable i i don't i don't i'm not familiar with the the practice on a personal level um but I understand the kind of like theology behind it. But again, to kind of Cyprian's point, um, it puts the emphasis in a, in, a, in, a, in a, I don't want to say wrong, like, I feel like I'm having to get all, you know, really like, but it, it puts the emphasis in, in, in the wrong place for us. It, it really does. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, okay, getting back to some etiquette. I would like to see more people doing this, whatever, blah, 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 because this is an, this is an example where there's some overlap in regards of that kind of Eucharistic adoration, adoration, right? So like you'll notice in, in, a, in, in a parish, depending on the piety of the parish, but typically speaking, people are crossing back and forth, they'll make the sign of the cross, right? Because the altar's in the center of the temple. If you're going left to right, right to left or whatever, you know, you make the sign of the cross. Um, and the reason for that is because in the tabernacle, the Eucharist is there, mm. the reserved sacraments are there. So there's this overlap in the, in that sense of like, that's how we would see like, yeah, we, we get it that regards that, that Eucharistic adoration, you know what I mean? But I think the thing is, is like, there's an aspect there, which I don't understand, and, you know, we should probably get someone to come in and comment on that. But um, I would say that, like, for instance, something that the Catholics, Roman Catholics do, which I think is great, you know, like the whole daily mass thing, like, that's great. You know what I mean? That's great. Now, mass for them can take 20 minutes, you know what I mean? And like, for us, that's like, that's proscomedi. That's not even like, the liturgy, you know, so, so there's a lot of things that are there that, that on a kind of practical level are, are difficult. And it begins to, you begin to see in these kind of like differences of, of practices, how you, you, if you're watching it, you can almost kind of see what, where the thread is found. Because for us, again, um, Again, you know, I, I, Mia Copa, whatever, but in my ignorance looking at it, the, the, the practice of Eucharistic adoration kind of like lends itself more to some of these things that we're talking about. Like, it's not meant to be, like, like the Eucharist is meant to be inside you. <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you're, you're, you're meant to, to engage. <sighs> Yeah, I, I want to be careful because there's, I could start going down a line of logic. I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but it it's it's just, it puts the emphasis in the wrong space. And from our perspective, from my perspective, from my perspective, it makes a lot of sense. That practice makes a lot of sense in light of everything I've been, I've been speaking on. You know what I mean? And the inverse is true for us. It it does not make sense that that type of you know devotion and practice would not make sense for us. It would be a very forced and foreign. It would be like not. It, it would be a foreign not within thing. the ethos of the church. Like no. that just doesn't feel like something. We no, would no, no. So so yeah. I mean, I mean. Anyways, um, that's a thing. But getting getting back to. I guess kind of putting a um, a period on the philoque aspect of it. Um, I would I would just say that um, 
we need to be really careful because there are lots of good intentions, but um, the divide there is, is, isn't as simple as people want to make it seem. That was some of the videos I found were some Catholics doing the pre-pro. Some of the Catholics were like, yeah, but you have to understand the context and why they said this. And it's not as big a deal as some Orthodox want it to be. And I was like, I don't know about that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyways, sorry, I just felt like that was um no that's it's a good thing it was excellent it was it's excellent a, it's a good thing we put the quarter in the machine father all you are was the song so yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I mean we knew what we were getting into yeah. um and it's interesting without getting too into it i saw a service performed by father this last uh saturday i had not seen before which was somebody coming in from the ethiopian church to our orthodox church and they having to renounce the Ethiopian stance on the fourth ecumenical council. Um, and that was interesting to me because um, again, you know, and I was one of them. So I don't, I don't want to act like, you know, um, that I'm better than anyone, but at the same time, it's, I was one of those guys that was like, Oh, you know, this probably comes down to translational error. Mm -hmm. Like this probably was just miscommunication. We really do believe the same thing. And oh, you know, all the the hundreds of years we've lost with this brother or sister church, you know, just due to this miscommunication. And that's not true. Like that's simply just not true. Um, the you know, um, yeah, what father said is true. Um, but at the same time. Uh, I think one of the temptations that people like me would take is, is that viewing this simply from a historical perspective, devoid of the influence of, you know, the divine, you know, um, the filioque, um, and I never say that word right, and I never will, and that's okay. But um, when, uh, you know, to, to act like that, what happened, what happened, because simply because of political and socioeconomic reasons, and, you know, reunification is in order and stuff like that. Um, uh, to do that and to ignore the underlying spiritual dimensions of what was happening is, you know, it's it, it does a disservice, I think, to um, the history of the church, the history of people in general, the history of the human race and our interactions with God. Um, so to have, um, you know you know what i'm saying father am i making sense like yeah no i mean yes it, it it matters um and that doesn't mean that you know again you know to stay on the real path unfortunately many will take that and and cease to be christ-like cease to deal with the situation in a christian brotherly manner um cease to deal with these situations with, with love that's not okay you know and like um, I know that, unfortunately, because I'm not the most intelligent guy, I'm not the most educated or learned, learned priest, I know that I can sometimes default to a kind of more polemical, um, you know, kind of approach. But, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not an academic theologian. I'm a preacher. You know, I'm not an academic theologian. Uh, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm a spiritual father, I'm a confessor, like that's my wheelhouse, you know what I mean? And for me, um, you know, one of the big things, um, like those who know me, like theology matters to me. Um, and one of my big things is I'm, I'm really into letting people know, like, no, you know, the, the, the essence energy issue matters to us, but, but I'm all about getting us to understand how it plays out into your life now. You know what I mean? Because I think for me, there's a place for it, but me, orthodoxy isn't, isn't a, a place to kind of like, you know, wank about and like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And like imposture, all these things. It's like, it, it's a matter of life, mm -hmm. you know, like dogma and theology is a matter of life. And so that it, it matters to me. And I think it matters to everyone. And, and for people who relegate it just to kind of like flexing their, you know, ability to put away facts I think they have I think they've got it wrong um, just like I think people often get it wrong where they take these these uncharitable unchristlike like positions 
with other Catholics, right? Because we're Catholic, right? We're, we're Catholic, small c. And, you know, we do have Catholic faith in common with Roman Catholics and Oriental, but at the same time, the other side of it, right? So that that's talking to the right side, but to the left side where it's just like, it, it doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. No, it matters. Yeah. It matters. And, and, it, and it matters on the level that I'm talking about. Like, the, we're not, we're not going to do it now, but the whole way I just, well, someone might think I'm full of it, which is fine. You're probably right, whatever. But the way I just spent this time kind of laying out pastorally, like boots on the ground, um, how that affects, that theology affects the, 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 the spiritual life of the everyday, you know, Catholic layman, whatever. I could go, I could do the same for the Oriental and from experience a little bit more, you know, having a small amount of time within the Coptic church before, um, before my wife and I, you know, um, were received in the Eastern church. We weren't received in the Coptic church or Italy church. We had a period of time there and having a lot of friends and everything and still do. I have, I have friends who are priests who are, you know, great men of God, you know, um, but the, but these things, you know, I, they're real and we can't just act like they're, they're not real. Um, and, and I think I would say this, it's interesting if you read the renunciations in our book, in our book of needs, there's, there's only one, there's only two renunciations for the Oriental. It, it's, and it's all around Chalcedon and they're, and they're just, they're just two. Whereas when you look in the Roman Catholics and the Reformation, there's a bunch Oh, no, that, oh, that no. Tell, that, that tells you something. Yeah. That tells you something because, you know, I had one guy tell me once, he's like, well, you know, I mean, he's like how I said to him, I said, if there's going to be any, if there's going to be any um, unification, if there's going to be any reconciliation that's going to happen, it's going to happen between the Eastern and the Oriental church way before the West and, and the East, he's like, no, how could that be? Because, you know, council all stuff. I said, no, you don't get it, man. Because when you, when you, when you look at the life, how, how the, the faith is lived out, the, there is truth to the fact that the Oriental and the Eastern church, we share in many ways, a similar ethos, right? That, that dogmatic issue of Chalcedon and the two natures of Christ, it's real. It's, it's a real thing. And, it's disingenuous to say that it's not okay great um but our ethos is is really similar whereas the ethos with with rome i'm sorry it's it's way more different than people realize and those okay. renunciations prove it you know what i mean it's like we're only we're only a few centuries removed from rome and from you know the reformation by proxy we're a millennia you know almost from from the from the oriental church but yeah our ethos are still way more similar that tells you something you know yeah i used to work with a bunch of ethiopian folk and there was there was more in common than not like yeah and i mean everyone put away your anathema you know like stamps or whatever yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be don't be jerks yeah. about it don't yeah. be jerks about it but um but uh yeah, that that I I struggle because you know, um, uh, with me having to like renounce some of my ecumenism, I I probably err too little a little bit too much still on the other side of, oh, what does this Catholic priest want? Like disregard, you know, everything this guy's got to say, and like that's not that's not prudent and it's not Christ like of me to do that because you know, there there are things you know there are things so. And that's what I'm doing better spiritually. I can remember that. So. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, maybe this is like a one for, I don't know, I'm sure we'll get some dialogue on it, but um, yeah, I think that like there, there are things that are going on now that make it a lot easier for a lot of Roman Catholics to see the necessity of of no longer just looking at it like oh it, it's kind of all the same thing and being like maybe there's something to this orthodoxy thing more than just the aesthetics of 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 you know quote-unquote byzantine sure. church because i've, I've he, seen it in my own circles father like in my own circles around me 
-hmm. I've been seeing, and it's been over the last year where it was like, okay, I'm going to uh, like Catholic friends, like, and contacts being like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to church more. I'm going. And then, then they were just like, yeah, I just got done with like my first Orthodox liturgy. You know what I mean? And it's just like, uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Wasn't, wasn't fitting the bill. Wasn't fitting the bill. Like they were like, yep, I'm going to really, really go all in on, on church. And then they were like, sorry, it's not fitting. The and these are like, these are like very Catholic people. Yeah. And I know it's got to be really difficult for them, this process, yeah. you know, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I, I can say this because, you know, <laughs> I'm sure she won't mind, but, um, you know, the, the senior nun here, you know, she's, she's often said, you know, she became Orthodox to be a better Catholic. Hmm. Hmm. You know? I mean, I got so, a lot of love for that lady. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess I can finish this with this, but I mean, it, it's difficult and it's difficult. I'm very lucky in the sense I was raised non-denominational in some sense, because I carried almost no baggage with me into, you know, orthodoxy. The, the non-denominational tried very hard not to define anything too terribly much. It was in, that's its own error because suddenly, oh, you know, it's all good. You know, like you're forgiven. It's not a big deal. So when someone, I didn't have like Calvinistic theology or I didn't have like, you know, uh, that's about the only one I know, but you know, some of these other ones like predestination or stuff like I didn't have any of that stuff to renounce, but, um, or rather to change my mind about, but, uh, I have, I, there's a, uh, a father I really like a priest, a priest monk, I really like, and I won't name him now because I'm not sure that he would want to stick by this quote. I think he would, but whatever, I don't want to get him in trouble, but he said that he will take an atheist or a communist over a Catholic most of the time, just because there's a, there's a open ground and there's, you know, um, there's like this ability to go in and start planting your own, like, you know, the seeds of orthodoxy without having to like take away some of the foliage mm -hmm. and, I, I didn't probably didn't get the proper context. He said for the spiritual child, he would rather do that. It's easier to have a commune. Yeah. Rather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it, that's an important distinction. An you got to say that because so that's, that's scandalous without the proper context. Yeah, the context yeah. is, you know, it, it, trying to help along like a spiritual child or something versus like, you know, like, like we we're saying earlier, there's commonality. I think we need to, increasingly fine right sure. um but in regards of like again like for me i would echo that sentiment if we're talking about um working with someone because i have spiritual children who come out of nothing much easier there's no baggage for them to work through in that in that same sense yeah you know what i mean i so. forgive me easier Easier is the word I would say. He not rather, rather meaning it's probably easier for him, easier for the spiritual child, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. So our new thing. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna talk about a saint for a second. And I hope this is a saint. I don't know how common the saint is or how well known the saint is, but I was thinking about a saint tonight, and there's lots of them. I think probably more of the well-known saints that I would want to talk about, but after doing this, some of the things I get ready for this podcast for this one popped to my brain. So I read the cult of the saints by St. John Chrysostom. Um, and uh, one of the ones that he talked about um, that always stuck with me and father, I'm going to have you vamp on this for a second. Do you know St. Barlam? Like, so which yeah. Saint Barlam? Which yeah. one? Uh oh, Saint Barlam, rather with the incense in the hand. Oh, he's one of my favorites. Yeah. Every year I gotta do I gotta serve liturgy for him. Okay. So mm -hmm. um the the story is that um they were trying, some of the pagans were getting to try to and what year was this? Um mm, oh geez, I'm very sorry, guys. This is excellent radio. Uh I'm not seeing, I'm seeing the date that the sermon was delivered. 
Not when Father, do you know what year he was around about? No, he's early though. He's yeah. early shape. Probably 200, 300, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's really early. Um, so St. Barlam, um, the story is, is that they were trying to get him to offer incense to the idols. And the way that they came up with that was to put a hot coal in his hand. Right, Father? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that he would instinct. And he's an old man, by the way. Okay, I did not know that. Real important to remember, we're talking about an old man, not like a young buck like you. An okay. Old man. Mm -hmm. um, and so that he would turn his hand like that and drop incense onto the, on, you know, and then therefore give incense. And rather, he just held his hand there and the coal burned all the way through his hand and then fell out the other side and no incense was offered. Um. And he so, died, if I'm not mistaken. And he died. That killed him, right? It killed that him. Killed correct. Him. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that struck me when my early 2020 repentance was the fact that um, St. John Chrysostom, and I think I had talked about this on the podcast before, but just in case, I am not necessarily a young buck that father made me out to be. I am an old man and I repeat myself sometimes, but he talked about that... Um, Sure, the flames hurt. Sure, the flames are destructive to your body, but they're nowhere near as dangerous as the flames of desire, right? Like the lustful, like fleshly desire and stuff like that. And one of the thoughts that hit me when I was reading this the first time was, oh, he's not being like, he's not like being like, like metaphorical. Like he's not saying like, oh, one day, you know, one day these flames of desire are really going to be hurting your soul. Like, no, right now, those are literally hurting you more than these actual physical flames are hurting you. Like your lustful desires, like the, the, the lustful fire that gets burned in your soul, that is actually much, much, much more destructive than, you know, the flames that martyrs are cast into you or whoever's cast into you or whatever those flames are secondary to these like inward flames that are, you know, that are, that rise up in you. So when I thought of a saint to talk about, this is the guy, you know, it, it was interesting to me that um, he popped into my head. And then I remember like one of my first, like real, like, Oh, he's being literal. He's not, he's not talking like poetically or metaphorically. Like he's being literal. Like he's saying like, no, this is more destructive to me. That was like a thought that hit me like a train when I first had it. And um, yeah, so that's that's uh, that's a fantastic book, by the way. Absolutely fantastic book. So, Father, you got anything? Uh, you got anything to say about that? No, I mean, on so many levels, Barlaam's an incredible uh, saint, um, and it goes to show the discernment. You know, the discernment that's given by God to the to the people um to really it i'll just say this because i feel like i've just talked way too much tonight but um <laughs> like we've we haven't talked about the old ac in a long time on here which is great whatever but the old um, ac the old ac not the air conditioner um you know it's just important to remember that there's it's the real path there's always a balance right like so on the one hand our lord calls us to watch the fathers call us to watch um and to and to look for the signs you know like we don't look for the signs to predict who the ac is but we look for the signs to see the 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 encroachment and the deception of the ac but on the other hand and this is why i'm bringing up barlam and this is what the point i want to get no, no one is going to be deceived in that sense. You know what I mean? Like if, if you want Christ ruling and reigning in your heart, we don't have, in essence, in essence, we don't have to be looking under, under rock, like, is this the antichrist? Is this the antichrist? Because it's, if, if we want Christ, he's going to give us that discernment, just like he did to Barlam. You know what I mean? Like, even in the face of pain and death, he wasn't tricked. I think that's, do you understand what I'm saying? I think, yeah. I think that's really key because with the guilt that we talked about, there's also this fear of like, you know, God is dangling you like a spider over like the abyss and that's not the case, you know? Um, 
if you love him, if you've given yourself to him, then trust him. He will give you the discernment you need in that day, just like he did Barlam. You know, he'll give you the type of discernment that will circumvent and bring you beyond pain of death. No, that's that's good. And what a whack sermon, right? The dangling spire of spider above the fire. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Yeah. Like that's kind of a yeah. Yeah, I don't mean to offend, but that's kind of a crazy sermon. Yeah. So, but anyways. Yeah. Who was the saint father that when they were roasting him, he said, I need to be flipped over so I can be done on the other side? Well, St. Lawrence said that. And I think there was also another one who said it, but St. Lawrence said it. But I think there was another one who said it too. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty wow. dope. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty dope. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, again, we come, I think, in the world of some of the stuff, at least I saw when I was researching this topic, we aired more towards the side of just trying to be understanding and compassionate about the subject. If we said anything terribly overtly offensive, like I'm speaking for myself, if I said anything like a caveman that hurt someone's feelings, I didn't mean to, you know, I didn't mean to do that. Um, uh, I, I've known some Catholic people and we agree on a lot. You know, there's a lot there that there's a lot of common ground. And now you okay, Protestant- so I'm you right there. I'm gonna stop you right there. I want this. This is how I want to close it out. Hold on, I want to talk crap on Protestants for just one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is how I want to close it out because I just gave. I, I talked to the kids about this a lot, and I just I did this whole thing on this last Friday with the kids. So I'm just gonna put it this way, right? Like, I'll spare everyone all the minutia of like going through all, all the scriptures, blah blah. blah but I, I would just say this, like, for any in any. any any non-Orthodox brothers and sisters out there, whether you're Catholic, Oriental, Protestant, whatever, like, and if you're Orthodox and if you're sitting there being like, yeah, stick it to them, let's just be really clear about something. Um, to him who's given, you know, much, much is expected. And when people say like, are non-Orthodox going to heaven? I would answer it this way. There's going to be a lot of Orthodox who aren't who aren't quote unquote going to heaven. Like we don't even think of it like going to heaven, but like what, <laughs> what is better? Is it better for someone in their ignorance to do much with little or for someone with everything to do nothing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let me, me a copa, let me hand that to my, to brothers and sisters who are not orthodox i would just say that you know and i would say to all my spiritual children who are listening to anyone who's orthodox you know may god help us in that and that's why we say lord have mercy may we never be triumphalistic in, in the wrong sense you know like it's all none of like i say over and over again you didn't study your way to the church if you think you did you're a fool like you found the church you were brought to the church Christ opened the door for you. And so you need to honor what Christ did and, and be a witness, be a witness to who Christ is. We need to preach the gospel in the true sense. Well, what is the gospel? Here's the gospel, right? God created man. How, what do you do? <laughs> this is the sermon today. Figure how, what do you do with a creation to keep, what do you do with human beings? How do you keep this creation that's been endowed with the greatest gift, which is free will from destroying the universe, right? Well, you have to give them a way to navigate that, that free will. And, you, and the way of navigating that free will is to know the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord, how do you discern that? Because so oftentimes we want to pursue what feels good and we want to reject what doesn't feel good. Well, oftentimes because of that, the word of the Lord comes to you and you know the right thing to do, but you don't want to do it because it seems painful. And that's where the cross comes in because the cross will, is the kind of divining rod to help you to understand what is of God and what isn't of God and, and when to pursue that painful path like Barlam, because it'll bring you to life versus the, the, the easy path, the, the less painful path leads you to death. What am I talking about? Why is all this matters? It matters because 
Orthodoxy isn't about having the historically correct church. Orthodoxy isn't about having correctness, period. Orthodoxy is about being in communion with Christ because he is eternal life. And he and the life that he gives us is only possible by the renunciation of ourselves. That's why we don't walk around with electric chairs around our necks. That's why we don't walk around with M16s around our necks. That's why we don't walk around with guillotines around our necks. Those are all instruments of death and execution, but not, they're not the cross. The cross is what it is, not because of that it kills, but because of the shame. And it's in the shame that we begin to discern what is of God and what isn't of God. What is of God and what is us. That's what it means to be orthodox. It has nothing to do with having the correct answers on the test. I agree. Just, yeah. And I would add, C.S. Lewis has done way more cool stuff than I ever will. And he was a Protestant. So, I mean, we're, we'll just say that. So, um, so uh, we're going to end there. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Uh, the Royal Path podcast music. It's still there. I've already added the stuff from tonight that we talked about. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll be back next week, God willing. And thanks for having a good night.